Hello again, and welcome to Advanced Physics for High School Students. This is Lesson 9, and it is entitled Newton's First Law, Free Body Diagrams and Reference Frames. You won't need a calculator for this topic. We'll continue to lay the groundwork for quantitative applications in the coming days. Newton's first law is called the law of inertia. You'll hear it referred to by that name, so you ought to know it. The inertia of an object is an object's resistance to changes in its motion. In this image, which wrestler has more inertia? It's the one that would be harder to shift from his position, the big one, of course. Alternatively, if these two guys were in motion, the big one would do you more damage if you had to stop him using your own strength. Etymologically, the term inertia derives from the Latin word inerse for laziness. You may have heard of inert gases in chemistry. They're the group eight gases, the noble gases, helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon. They're the ones that don't react because they're lazy. Alternatively, imagine trying to throw a lead brick at somebody. A typical lead brick weighs about 25 pounds, and trying to hurl it at someone across the baseball diamond would hurt your arm. The brick is inert. It is lazy. It wants to keep doing what it's already doing. In this case, sitting still. Once that lead brick is put into motion, trying to stop it would cause you some pain, too. You wouldn't want to catch this lead brick moving at 90 miles an hour, the speed of a fastball pitched by a professional ball player. The lead brick is inert. It's lazy. It wants to keep on doing what it's already doing. In this case, moving at 90 miles an hour. Numerically, we measure an object's inertia by its mass. The more massive the object is, the more inertia it has. There are all sorts of units for measuring mass. The most common one you'll see is the metric unit, the kilogram, and its smaller relative, the gram. There are 1,000 grams in the kilogram, as you probably already know. Interestingly enough, the English unit for mass is the slug, not the slimy garden creature, but rather derived from the idea of sluggishness or inertness. And this might be just as good a time as any to spend a moment talking about units in this course. We're mostly going to be working with something called MKS units, the meter, kilogram, second set of units, also called the Système International, which is French for International System, or SI units. The College Board exam that you'll take in May is almost exclusively written using these units. There's another set, the CGS system, centimeter, gram, second. You'll see this system sometime employed as another set of metric units. And you ought to know how to convert between the various metric sets of units, employing a variety of prefixes to mean certain multiplying factors in the coming months. Prefixes such as giga, as in a certain gigabyte drive, mega, as in a certain number of megawatts, micro, as in microwaves, nano, as in nanotechnology, pico, as in picofarads, and there are several others. These are some of the more common ones besides the common kilo and centi and the like. You'll become proficient at writing these with their appropriate multipliers, giga is 10 to the ninth, mega is 10 to the sixth, micro is 10 to the minus six, nano is 10 to the minus ninth, pico is 10 to the minus twelfth, Kilo is 10 to the third, centi is 10 to the second, milli is 10 to the minus three. You'll become proficient at writing these in their appropriate multipliers during this course. The English set, sometimes called the foot-pound-second or the FPS system, is what we're most familiar with here in the United States. It's often very handy to know that one inch is equal to 2.54 centimeters and one kilogram is equal to 2.2 pounds. These two conversion factors are some of my best friends. Now, let's get back to Newton's first law. The law of inertia is a basic statement of this common experience. Objects tend to keep moving the way that they're already moving, which is to say that they'll move with a constant velocity or they'll move with a constant speed in a straight line unless they're acted upon by an unbalanced force. Most of us would probably agree that this certainly applies to objects at rest. We recognize that it takes effort to move a stationary object. What might be more difficult to grasp, though, is that Newton's first law also applies with equal validity 
to objects in motion. Our common experience is that moving objects tend to slow down on their own. Objects don't need someone to push on them to slow them down to get them stopped moving. I don't need brakes to get a car to coast to a stop. Eventually, it's going to slow down on its own. Most folks think that to keep an object moving, a constant force is required. I can't keep my car moving at 70 miles an hour on the interstate without the, the engine applying a force to the wheels. Where's the inertia in that? Well, it turns out that, in fact, most moving objects in our common experience do feel or experience an unbalanced force in the form of friction, that force that we studied in a previous lesson. What I want you to take away from this is that moving objects do not require unbalanced forces to keep them moving. That's so important that I'm going to write it down, and so should you. Objects don't require an unbalanced force to maintain straight line constant speed motion. Now notice I've underlined the words unbalanced force. In a moment, we'll employ free body diagrams to help us determine what the unbalanced force is. But for now, think about your common experience. If I want to keep, say, a wagon moving at a constant speed, I must apply a constant force. But this force is to balance the frictional force that's experienced by the wagon. Were I to stop pulling on the wagon, the unbalanced frictional force would slow it down. So I keep pulling on the wagon to keep the object moving. I have to pull on the wagon harder than the frictional force to get it to start moving, and then once it's in motion, I keep pulling on it to balance the frictional force. It's the wagon's inertia that keeps it moving once it's started, not my pulling force. All my pulling force does is to balance the frictional force. So let's move on to sketch some free body diagrams. Let's examine this wagon pulling situation with its forces. Let's assume that the wagon moves at a constant speed in a straight line. In future lessons, we'll take up objects that don't move with constant speeds or don't move in straight lines. Those will be called accelerated objects. But for right now, we'll look at this easier situation. I want to focus on what's happening to the wagon because ultimately, I'd like to be able to describe the wagon's motion. Certainly, the wagon is interacting with other objects which have their own motions that will be affected by the presence of the wagon. But we want to keep our attention on the wagon, on this one object. Why, might you ask, am I interested in describing the forces acting on the wagon, acting on this one object? The most immediate reason is that in May, you'll have an AP exam that's going to require you to demonstrate this skill. But more importantly, Understanding and knowing the forces acting on the object will allow you to describe how the object moves. And alternatively, if you know the motion of the object, that is, where it is, its position, how fast that it's moving, its velocity, and how the velocity is changing, its acceleration, if you know the object's motion, that allows you to deduce something about the forces that are acting on it. Let's focus on the wagon. We're going to model the wagon as if it were a single point and sketch the forces that are acting on it. I'm going to suggest to you that there are four forces acting on this wagon. We've done this before, but we'll do it again here to solidify the ideas in your mind. The first force is the obvious one. I pull the wagon at some angle. We'll call this the pulling force, Fp, acting some at some angle, theta which is usually measured with respect to a horizontal axis. Fp is Haynes pulling the wagon at some angle theta with respect to the horizontal. There are two objects that are interacting through this force. Haynes exerts the force, the wagon experiences the force, and theta is the direction at which the force acts. Some of you can probably spot that eventually we're going to break this pulling force into horizontal and vertical components using our trig functions and the angle theta, just as we'll do with other vectors. But we'll get to this at a later time. There's a second force that's acting. The Earth gravitationally pulls the wagon towards its center, downward in this case. We call that the weight of the wagon. Now you may notice in my notation I'm using the letter capital F to represent the forces and I use subscripts with these forces to tell me something about the origin of the force. A third force that's acting is the ground 
pushing up on the wagon to support it. The ground is a horizontal surface, and this horizontal surface exerts a vertical force that's perpendicular to the plane. So we can call this kind of force a normal force, Fn. The ground pushes the wagon upward. Finally, there's a resisting force acting on the wheels of the wagon to slow it down as I pull it along. And we'll call that the frictional force, FF. Now what object is exerting this force? What object is slowing the wagon down as it's being moved to the right? I'm going to suggest that it's the surface of the ground pushing the wagon to the left, opposing the wagon's motion. Maybe it's grass if I'm on a lawn. Maybe it's sand or gravel if I'm on a rough surface. Maybe it's a very small force acting due to a very hard surface, such as the pavement. But whatever it is, its source is the thing that the wheels of the wagon touch, the surface of the ground. So we'll say the surface of the ground pushes the wagon to the left. Were the wagon moving, we would call this the kinetic frictional force. If the wagon is stationary and I'm just beginning to pull it to get it going, we would call this resisting force the static frictional force. So now we've got the ground exerting two components of a force. The vertical part pushing up on the wagon we call the normal force and the horizontal part retarding the wagon's motion we call the frictional force. Now I want you to notice that in all four of these forces there are two objects that are interacting. One object exerts the force and the other object experiences the force. In this case the object we're focusing on is the wagon and it is the object that experiences the force in all of these cases. In a later lesson we'll tackle the other end of this interaction, the objects exerting the force, but for our free body diagrams we want to focus more on the object that's experiencing the force, not the objects that are exerting the force. Also notice there's a direction associated with each of these forces. There's the pulling force, which acts at an angle theta. There's the normal force, which is pushing upward. There's the weight, which is in the downward direction. There's the frictional force that's dragging the wagon to the left. Whenever objects interact in this way, there's a direction associated with the force. We'll come to call these quantities vector quantities, vectors having both a strength and a direction. We will come to contrast vector quantities with something called scalar quantities that possess only magnitude. Examples of vectors are things like forces, velocity, acceleration. Things that are scalar would be things such as temperature, time. Finally in this lesson, let's turn our attention to this concept of unbalanced forces, also known as net forces or the sum of all the forces. All of these terms are synonymous. And so, if and when you hear folks referring to them using these different names, and you'll hear many physicists from many different places using them all, these terms all mean the same thing. Mathematically, the symbol we use to represent them is the sum, the capital Greek letter sigma the sum of all the forces. And since forces are vector quantities, you'll often see them written with an arrow above them. So, in this case, with the wagon we're talking about, we see that there are four forces that are acting. And we could write this vector sum in this way. The net force is equal to the pulling force plus the normal force plus the weight force plus the frictional force. All of these forces have a magnitude. All of these forces have a direction. You'll see that eventually we're going to break forces into components and we're going to take a look at horizontal components and vertical components independently of each other. So to review, in this lesson we've introduced Newton's first law of motion, the law of inertia. We've looked again at free body diagrams and we've introduced a notation for the unbalanced force acting on objects. We'll begin to cultivate these ideas in future lessons as we tackle applying them to the object's motion. But for now, that's it.